Stephen Covey, who's probably best known for his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, tells this story about this experience that he had one time on a New York City subway car, where one morning, one Sunday morning, he gets into the subway, and what he paints is a very peaceful and serene and even calm-like scene. People are sitting in their seats, and they're reading their books, or some are reading newspapers and taking in the morning news. Others are dozing in their seats, and some are just contemplating with their eyes closed, he says. And it was a very peaceful and calm scene. A couple of stops later, though, the, the train pulls into the station, and a father and his two children get on the train, and all of, all of a sudden, they're yelling at each other. The kids are yelling at each other, and they're screaming at each other, and they're hitting each other, and they're taking people's newspapers, and then they're hitting each other with those. And it, what was a very calm and relaxing scene has now become very disruptive. And, and Stephen says, I can find myself just getting very irritated and annoyed by it all. And looking around the train, there were others seated around the family that were getting annoyed and irritated and agitated by all the hitting and the screaming and the, all that stuff that was going on. And so Stephen says, I finally got up. And what I thought was a very calm uh, restraint and with patience. And, and I went and I said, sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't uh, control them a little bit better. And the man, um, Stephen says, looking like he just came back to reality. He's been out uh, somewhere in his mind, lost in his thoughts. The man turned to Stephen. And he said, well, you're right. I probably should do that. Thank you. I, I, I'll do that. And he said he went on. The man said, he explained to Stephen that they had just come from the hospital that morning uh, where his wife, the mothers uh, of the children, had had an emergency surgery done way early in the morning, in the middle of the night. And there were complications from that surgery. It did not go well, so much so that they had to induce a coma, and now she was in a coma. And he said, I am so lost, I am so afraid, I don't know what to do, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. But you're right, I probably should do something for them. I was taking them home for some lunch. I was trying to get them away from the hospital because we've been there all night and I just wanted to get them away for a little bit. But I don't guess, I guess they're not handling it all that well. And probably I'm not either. I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. Stephen said, can you imagine how I felt in that moment? And suddenly I saw things differently. I saw him differently. And because I saw differently, I, I behaved differently. Those irritations that I've had, that they were bubbling up inside of me, they were now, they were now gone. I didn't have to worry about controlling my, my attitude because I was filled with this man's pain. And I, I felt compassion and, and sympathy flow through me. And he said, I just sat there and I talked to him and I said, oh, I'm so sorry you know, tell me, what's your wife's name? Tell me about your wife. Is, is there anything that I can do for you or for your children? I'd like to help if I can. He said, I just talked to him. And then Stephen said, but nothing really changed on that subway train. All of it was still the same. It was the same people, the same children, the same irritated looks, and the ones who poked their head up from reading their books or their newspapers or who, who were snoozing and just got woken up. He said, nothing was changing. Nothing changed. But what did change, Stephen said, was a way of seeing it all. And with seeing, a change in me, he said. I want to talk this morning about that very thing, about seeing. About seeing from a new perspective, about perspective. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Paul's letter to the Ephesians beginning in chapter 1, and, and hear now the Word of God. Paul says, I have heard of the faith, of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and of your love towards all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. And I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of the power for us who believe according to the working of his great 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've been talking the last several weeks about the heart of the matter, of looking at at ways in which Jesus empowered the disciples to give to the world that which he had given to them. And, and, and so Paul, here at the beginning of his letter to Ephesians, he's doing just that. He is recapping and describing for the church all of the things that Jesus has given to us and all of the, the things that we have received, who we are and whose we are, and all that we possess as followers of Jesus Christ. And Paul says things like, we have love, we have a love that's been passed on to us, and we are to pass that on to others. We have an inheritance, a gift that's been given to us that we are to pass on to others. We have the assurance of God who, who walks alongside of us and asks us to walk alongside of Him and each other. And we have an intimacy with God, a God that chooses us, that knows us and wants us to know Him because He literally delights in our very being. And so Paul says, in light of all of that, in, all, in light of all of this good news, in light of all of these blessings that have been given to us, in light of a God who literally delights in all of us, who has lavished us with his grace, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may see what you already possess. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be opened because we see more clearly when our hearts are opened. Paul would say, I know that from experience. Blindness and limited vision go with a closed heart. We don't see clearly when our hearts are closed. Paul might say, I didn't see clearly at one time. If you remember the story of Paul, there's Paul on the road to Damascus and he's on his way and he's got a fire in his eyes for sure because he's got papers in his hands and he is ready to, to have those who disagree with his way of thinking and, and his way of seeing things and to have them out of the way, out of the picture, out of sight, out of mind, done away with. And then he met Jesus. And Luke tells us that in that experience, it was almost as if scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see. But what changed on that road? It was still the same road. It was still the same people. But what changed, Paul might say, was a way of seeing. What changed was me. And so he sets out here to pray for the church. And he adds that he hopes the eyes of their hearts, the eyes of our hearts, would be enlightened and would be opened up as well. Because an open heart and seeing go together. We see more clearly when our hearts are opened. We see the person right in front of us, right in front of our face. We see the landscape stretched out before us. We see more gratitude when our hearts are open. We, we have more compassion when our hearts are opened. Maybe that's why Jesus spent so much time in his earthly ministry trying to get us to open up our hearts. Jesus, time and time again, put people first. And they, they argued with him. They said, why do you keep healing on the Sabbath? And Jesus said, Jesus would say, no, 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 no. Why, why are you trying to hinder God's love? There was a time where they brought children, women brought their children up to him. And, and the disciples were saying, no, get those children away. Get the kids away. We don't have time for them. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Why are you trying to hinder God's love? There's that beautiful story in the scripture where they brought that woman to Jesus. I wish we knew her name. I don't know her name. But do you remember the story? They brought, they brought the woman to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we need to stone her. She's been caught in acts of indiscretion. And Jesus said, no. You remember what he did? He bent down. And he started scribbling in the sand. I don't know what he wrote. I wish we knew what he wrote. Maybe it was, why do you hinder God's love? I don't know. 
But time and time again, Jesus sought to remind the disciples, even after the resurrection, that this was not the end of his presence with the world, but it was the beginning of how we will carry his heart within our own. To be the body of Christ, to be the church, is to see the world through the eyes of Jesus, to see through the eyes of love. And as disciples and as the church, we do, we try to create the same conditions of love that he did while he was on earth. And so Paul says, he writes to the church here and he says, I, I pray, church. I pray. When I think about all of you and I think about all that your ways that you're doing things and all that you're doing, I pray, church, that the eyes of your heart would continually be open so that we can be the best representation of his love to those we meet. That's Paul's prayer. To look through the eyes of our hearts. To look through the eyes of love. Because when our level of love goes up, our level of appreciation and gratitude goes up with it. And I've thought a lot about that this week. And I've asked you to think a lot about that this week. And I, I've asked you to send in some videos to me as you look around where you are in your life. Because so many things during this time, so many things have provided us with so much negative attention. You turn on the news and it's bad news. You hear reports, it's bad reports. And we can, we can become focused on so many wrong things. So I invited you this week to look. What did you see in front of you? What did you see in front of you that may have been something or someone you see every day, but look different through the eyes of love. I want to share a little bit of what you sent to me this morning. Things that you said you saw. Things that we see through the lenses of love. I have seen God's love demonstrated during this time um, through people in my neighborhood checking on one another, through um, all the schools in our area working really hard to make sure that each of the kids feels loved and missed, and through churches like ours, um, accepting the challenge that you're going to have to try a lot of new things to try to help the congregation feel united and encouraged when we can't be together. I've seen a lot of families outside enjoying um, each other and the nice weather, and that's been very nice. I think the shepherding program at the church is wonderful. I think everyone is working so hard to make sure that everyone is contacted and feels needed. And if there's something that we can't physically do to help another, we try to find that help. I hope that, can pro that program continues even after we're back together in the sanctuary. Um, one way that I have seen God throughout this quarantine time is how many people have spent quality time with their families when they haven't really had that chance before because they've had to work or had to rush, rush, rush to get all these errands done. It's, I think one of the good things with quarantine, it's really caused people to stop and think about what's really important in their lives. Um, seeing people out taking walks, enjoying nature, and just seeing the beauty of the world around them, I think has been a big way that I've seen God throughout this quarantine. But I see it in the ways that people react to each other, how they help each other out with finding things. People that are employed in these places are always so helpful and kind. Um, cleaning the buggies, I realize they're supposed to do that, but you know, that's still a labor of love. Uh, the people that don't run over you in the parking lot, who actually stay aside so that you can find your place in the parking lot. 
the calling on each other and our church I think is so great about that calling on people and their friends in church to see how they are and what they're doing and what things they may need um, the community has banded together from the schools how they have distributed lunches to the children all during this pandemic how the parents have come together and schooled their children at home <laughs> which is not easy I have always tried to be an optimist, tried to find the good out of the bad. When I was reading um, my Jesus Calling devotional the other day, it said that um, I can bring good out of every situation you encounter. And I thought about that and what you had asked us to do, and I think in that I see families spending more time together, just slowing down, um, neighbors checking on neighbors. We've just realized that we don't have to go at such a fast pace that we can do with a little less and spend a little more time with family and friends. And I think it has brought us closer to God. The story of the last time that the disciples saw Jesus. It is, it's a story about blessing. Jesus blesses them. And Jesus says that as his witnesses to the presence, to his presence and, and to the presence of the resurrection, that they too will be filled with the power to carry on his ministry, to be his hands and his feet to the world. And so Paul writes to the church, he writes to us, and he says, Open the eyes of your hearts and carry his heart within yours. Because to see the world through the eyes of Jesus is to see through the eyes of love. And Paul says, Jesus says, that's the heart of the matter. And together we say, Amen. If you will, pray with me. Gracious God, we bow our heads before you. And we pray that you would strengthen our hearts and our minds. And may your love be the rich soil in which our lives are rooted, O oh God. May your love be the firm foundation on which we build. May your love be so deeply rooted in us that we truly understand how long and how high and how wide and how deep your love really is. God, fill us with your fullness and the power that comes from you alone. So that our lives would reflect your goodness and your grace. God, we continue now to pray for our world. We continue to pray for our nation, our country, our community, our loved ones. God, we ask you to be with us as a church as we seek to love more. As we seek to open our hearts to know you more and to know you better. God, we come before you now when we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. As he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.